It began not with stone or bone, but with a sliver of wood, lost, buried and preserved in silence for hundreds of thousands of years beneath the ancient lake bed of Schöningen. When excavators finally brought it to light, they uncovered far more than just an old spear. What emerged from the muck was a revolution in understanding. This wasn't merely a hunting tool, it was a message carved in wood, a declaration of craftsmanship, foresight and communal life by a species long misunderstood. For decades, Neanderthals were portrayed as clumsy, brutal cousins of modern humans. Their image, shaped by outdated assumptions, presented them as lacking the intelligence or creativity to make complex tools or plan large hunts. But the discovery of dozens of carefully crafted wooden weapons, including complete spears and throwing sticks, now shows that the truth was very different. These were not the tools of primitive brutes. These were the creations of master woodworkers engineers of the Ice Age, and strategists who worked in teams and passed their skills down through generations. And the most surprising twist? These tools aren't just old. They're now believed to be younger than once thought, placing them directly in the hands of Neanderthals themselves. Their story rewrites our history and challenges everything we once assumed about who these ancient people really were. In most of the prehistoric world, wood vanishes, it rots, burns, disintegrates, leaving behind only the more durable stone, bone and shell. For this reason, our picture of early human life has always been incomplete. We knew ancient people used wood, but we lacked the evidence to understand how deeply they depended on it or how sophisticated their woodworking truly was. Then came Schöningen. This site in northern Germany, once an open-cast lignite mine, turned out to be a time capsule sealed by the waterlogged layers of an ancient lake. There, wooden objects had been buried quickly and deeply enough to avoid decomposition. Over time, the oxygen-free conditions preserved not just fragments, but entire spears and tools in remarkable condition. These weren't broken splinters or decayed leftovers. They were full-length, finely crafted implements frozen in time, and what they revealed changed everything. Among the most revelatory discoveries at Schöningen was not just the presence of wooden tools, but the method by which many of them were made, a technique known as wood splitting. While the crafting of spears from whole branches or trunks has garnered the most attention, it was the evidence of sophisticated splitting and shaping of wood for other tool types that added an entirely new dimension to the understanding of early woodworking traditions. In modern terms, wood splitting involves cleaving timber along its natural grain, producing flat or pointed forms from a larger block of wood. For ancient toolmakers, without saws or metal implements, this method allowed them to make the most of every tree they harvested. Splitting gave them control over shape and size, and allowed for rapid production of symmetrical points and straight shafts. At Schöningen, this wasn't just an ad hoc technique. It was a standardized method applied with surprising precision. Researchers have now identified more than 35 such tools crafted by splitting spruce and pine. Some are long and narrow with pointed tips, possibly used for digging, skin preparation, or as part of composite tools. Others have rounded ends, suggesting domestic or utilitarian roles beyond hunting. These implements show clear signs of being worked with skill, scraped, shaped, and sometimes even smoothed, making use of the split's natural edges to reduce labour and increase structural integrity. What's most striking is that wood splitting had never before been seen in the Paleolithic record at this level of refinement. Until the Schöningen finds, such techniques were thought to be the domain of much later populations, particularly Homo sapiens in the Holocene. The presence of split wood tools dating back 200,000 years or more now forces a re-evaluation of when and how such technologies evolved. It turns out that Neanderthals, or their close relatives, were already engaging in what can only be described as early carpentry. The process of splitting wood effectively requires more than brute strength. It requires forethought. The person must understand how the wood will behave under pressure, how knots and grain direction affect the fracture line, and how to manipulate the split to produce the desired shape. This knowledge doesn't appear overnight. It reflects a long tradition of observation, practice and transmission. Another signal of the cultural depth behind these tools, 
the use of split wood also speaks to resource efficiency. Rather than wasting parts of a tree that couldn't be turned into spears, the craftspeople of Schoningen made use of offcuts and fragments. Some of these tools may have been shaped from broken weapons, giving them a second life. Others were likely made specifically for tasks such as hide preparation, where pointed sticks could help remove flesh or soften skins before tanning. The existence of this broader wooden toolkit challenges the assumption that Paleolithic people relied primarily on stone for all cutting, pounding or scraping tasks. It suggests instead that we've been missing a vital part of their daily lives simply because wood is rarely preserved. Where stone tools were prized for their sharpness and durability, wooden tools could be crafted more quickly, repaired more easily, and adapted for a wider range of soft material tasks. At Schöningen, we see the emergence of a true wood-based technological tradition, a knowledge system that likely paralleled and complemented the more visible stone industries. In this light, woodworking was not merely an extension of stone tool production, it was its own domain of expertise. The people who split, shaped and repurposed wood were engineers in their own right, fluent in the medium of forest and fire. Thus, the spears may have made the headlines, but it is the split wood tools that whisper of an even broader mastery, one that extended from the hunt into the home, from the drama of ambush to the quiet hours of preparation and repair. They remind us that what was lost to decay for most of human prehistory is not the story of what was never done, but of what was simply made from wood and forgotten by time. The people of Schöningen selected specific types of trees, spruce, pine and larch, not just because they were nearby, but because they offered ideal properties for tool-making. These woods were flexible yet strong, lightweight but resilient. The process began with careful selection of branches or trunks. The bark was stripped away, sometimes with stone tools, and the wood was shaved, scraped and shaped using techniques that modern woodworkers would recognize. But these weren't crude or haphazard methods. The spears were double-pointed and finely balanced. The grain of the wood was respected, not fought against. The pith of the tree, the soft central tissue, was positioned along the sides of spear tips rather than through the center, preventing breakage on impact. In some cases, the wood was even seasoned, dried slowly to reduce cracking before final shaping. There is evidence of polishing, sanding and smoothing the shafts for better handling. These were personal tools used often and maintained with care. And there were many of them. Excavations have now revealed nearly 200 worked wooden artifacts from this single site, an unprecedented number. Among them are at least 10 complete spears, several throwing sticks, and more than 30 tools made from split wood, many of which were used for domestic tasks like softening animal hides or digging. One of the most fascinating discoveries at Schöningen was a pair of shorter double-pointed sticks, less than a metre in length. At first their purpose was unclear. Too small for hunting large game, they were seen as oddities. But closer analysis revealed they were aerodynamic, carefully shaped and built to be thrown. Unlike modern javelins which are hurled overhead, these throwing sticks would have rotated through the air like a boomerang, ideal for hitting fast-moving game like rabbits or birds. Their design suggests a democratization of hunting. These weren't weapons meant only for the strongest warriors. Lightweight and easy to wield, they could have been used by youths or even children learning to hunt. This points to a broader social context. Hunting was a community effort. Children likely practiced and played with these tools, learning coordination, teamwork and precision from an early age. The throwing sticks may have been used to herd animals, confuse them, or flush them into ambushes. In the hands of a skilled thrower, they could deliver deadly force from up to 30 meters away. What's more, these sticks weren't mass-produced or disposable. Their surfaces show signs of repeated handling, resharpening, and maintenance. They were valued, used over time, and eventually lost, perhaps in the excitement of a hunt. Their presence at Schöningen suggests a culture where woodworking was not just utilitarian, but integrated into daily life and ritual. For years, the spears of Schöningen were thought to date back around 300,000 to even 400,000 years, 
a time when Homo heidelbergensis is believed to have lived in Europe. But new research using amino acid geochronology has challenged this assumption. By analyzing fossil proteins directly from the same sediment layers as the spears, scientists now estimate that the artifacts are around 200,000 years old. This revelation changes everything. It places the spears squarely in the Neanderthal era. Far from being pre-Neanderthal tools inherited by later populations, these weapons were likely designed, crafted, and used by Neanderthals themselves. And what that tells us is profound. Neanderthals were not passive recipients of technological traditions. They were innovators in their own right. They didn't just survive in Ice Age Europe. They thrived there, mastering the environment and crafting tools from perishable materials with the same care and intelligence as their Homo sapiens cousins would tens of thousands of years later. Crafting a wooden spear is not simple. It requires a multi-stage process that demands understanding of materials, patience, and planning. You need to choose the right type of wood, not too brittle, not too soft. You need to shape it while it's green, but not so green that it warps when drying. You must balance the weight, center the shaft, taper the tips, and remove branches without weakening the core. Finally, you must finish it, smoothing, scraping, and perhaps even polishing the shaft to ensure it can fly straight or be thrust with precision. This isn't something you stumble into. It's a learned tradition. It implies teaching, memory, and trial and error over generations. It suggests social cooperation, where older members of the group pass on their skills, and younger ones absorb the knowledge through doing, observing, and refining. At Schöningen, the tools themselves preserve the record of this cognitive ability. Some spears bear evidence of repair, resharpening, or modification. Others appear to have been made from recycled fragments. A few broken points were reshaped, and used again. This efficiency and adaptability point to a mental world where tools weren't static. They had life cycles, identities, and value. The context of the Schöningen finds is just as telling as the tools themselves. The spears were discovered alongside the remains of dozens of horses and other large game animals. These animals weren't scavenged, they were hunted. Their bones bear marks of butchery. Some were driven into the lake where they were slaughtered en masse. This was not the work of lone hunters. It was organized group activity. The Neanderthals who wielded these spears planned their hunts with care. They knew the habits of the animals. They worked together to trap, flank, and overwhelm them. And they had the tools to do it. Spears were used for both thrusting and throwing. Throwing sticks were likely used to create chaos or target smaller prey. The entire landscape was part of their strategy, a hunting ground shaped by knowledge and shared purpose. These cooperative behaviours reflect a society that valued communication, planning, and perhaps even leadership. They point to early forms of language, gesture, and group decision-making. Hunting wasn't just about survival. It was a social event, an opportunity to bond, teach, and remember. The implications of Schöningen go far beyond the site itself. If this many wooden tools have survived in one location, how many more were made across Europe and lost to decay? How many cultures of ancient woodworkers have vanished without trace simply because the material didn't fossilize? For every spear that survives in the mud, there may have been hundreds that vanished in dry soil. For every throwing stick we find, there may have been thousands used by children across generations. We may have underestimated entire technological traditions simply because we couldn't see them. What Schöningen offers is a rare window into this hidden wooden world. It shows us not only what Neanderthals did, but how they thought. It reveals minds capable of long-term planning, abstract design, and the transmission of knowledge. It shows people who could adapt tools to purpose, repair what broke, and choose the best material for the job. It shows a culture that could harness the forest not only to survive, but to thrive. The image of Neanderthals as dumb and doomed has finally shattered. In its place stands a richer, more human portrait, one built not from the remains of bone or stone, but from the subtle grain of wood. The people of Schöningen weren't apes fumbling in the dark. They were craftsmen and craftswomen, hunters and parents, elders and learners. 
They stood in the flickering light of birch groves and pine forests, shaping spears from trees felled with their own hands. They carved, polished, and tested. They taught their children how to feel the weight of a good shaft, how to judge the balance, how to launch it true. They planned hunts. They gathered at lakeshores. They remembered the old trails and watched the herds with calculating eyes. And when the time came, they moved as one, unleashing a flurry of wood, strength, and strategy that speaks across the millennia of minds as sharp as their spear tips. These wooden weapons are not just artifacts. They are echoes. They whisper of forgotten hands and vanished paths. And they remind us that intelligence is not always written in stone. Sometimes it is carved into the grain of a tree and lost, until one day the earth decides to tell its story again. Thank you for watching and please leave a comment and click the like and subscribe buttons.